Well, good morning, everyone. Smiles, friendly church family. Um, so I missed you last week as I was preaching in Clinton, South Carolina. And, uh, you know, we had a pulpit exchange coordinated post-General Assembly. It was, it was beautifully strategized. Um, and then there was a sudden curveball. Thankful that Andrew Hain could fill in on short notice. But I missed you, and I missed this time with you. So I will pick up where we left off and just say this. Nuts and bolts hold the world together, right? Nuts and bolts are those things which keep everything held together tightly. And I've been trying to preach through a philosophy of ministry, which I know can be painstaking to hear. I realize that. It's even more painstaking to teach and preach through. But I really think that this is worth doing. I promise you. It is my effort to, as much as is possible, get us all on the same page of thought so that we can seek to do some great things together. Amen? Amen. So last week, or the last time I was with you, I told you I was going to do a few weeks on presuppositions. And presupposition number one was what? God is at work. We just understand that God is at work work. Now this morning, this is what makes today so hard. I'm going to do presuppositions two, three, and four because I don't want you to have to endure this for too many more weeks. And I'm trying to time it with the start of the fall where we can start a study of Hebrews together. So there's a little teaser of where we're going. But this morning, the three presuppositions are that the Bible is true and trustworthy. Theology is possible and that the church is a real thing that exists and persists. But to get there, our scripture reading is Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 27, with great emphasis on verse 27. I think that's the only passage that you have a slide for, but I'm going to read the other verses. Um, And I'll introduce the text this way. So we know what happened on Easter morning, right? Jesus rose from the dead. But what was Jesus doing on Easter afternoon? Do you know? What was Jesus doing on Easter afternoon? Quite simply, we know that He went for a walk. And you could say He went for a walk and a talk uh, to spend some time talking to some men. That's the account we have. Easter afternoon, on Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 27. It says, Now that same day, and that is the day that He rose, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus Himself came up, and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing Him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked Him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find His body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said He was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow in heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things 
and then enter His glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning Himself. Let's pray that God would help us understand His Word. Our Father in Heaven, my prayer this morning would be short and simple. That You would show us the beauty of Scripture and all of its teaching. And that You would show us Your great love for Your church. And we pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise, a luxury cruise. Perhaps you've at least seen commercials for one on TV. And if that's all you've seen, uh, just picture that as I describe it for a moment. In 2014, my whole family, my siblings, their families, we celebrated my parents' 50th wedding anniversary by all going on a cruise together. And we were excited. We, I had been on one cruise in, in high school, but uh, it, was, it was exciting for the children. And surely nothing could go wrong, right? Never mind the fact that by the end of the cruise, we were saying things like, we'll never do this again, <laughs> as a norovirus swept through the ship and our entire family, affecting all but one of our strongest children, <laughs> to not be names. But never mind that. Picture in your mind what you know about a cruise and a cruise ship, or at least what you've seen on commercials. The things you probably picture are things like the pool deck, the sun deck, the cafeteria, the bar, the nightclub, all the fun festivities of the cruise ship. That's what we picture and that's what we see advertised in images, right? Because that's where the good stuff is. What you don't see in commercials and what you don't see on the cruise ship is the engineer's room and where the engines are and where it's hot and probably stuffy and miserable. And there are switches and dials and knobs and engineers making sure that everything is functioning as it should, right? This morning, I'd like to take you into the engineer's room, as boring as that might seem. But without the engineer's room, there is no pool deck, there is no cafeteria, there is no nightclub, there's certainly no going to a destination. Uh, the ship doesn't move without the engines in the room. So this morning, we're talking about three presuppositions, the Bible, theology, and the church. And just to remind, uh, or if you weren't here, a, a presupposition in ministry is just like a presupposition in anything else. It's something that you presuppose to be true. You assume that it's true, and you operate accordingly. It's not something up for debate. It's not something that is an issue to be hashed out. Uh, it's, it's something akin to gravity, that hot things are hot and cold things are cold, rocks are hard, feathers are soft. Those are our presuppositions. We just, from our perspective, we know those things are true. So this morning, as I go over presuppositions 2, 3, and 4, know that these are the, these are the things that the, the elders, the session, these are things we would talk about in that room. That's the engine room of sorts. wouldn't normally preach about these things in this way, but I've determined that I just think it's important for all of us to hear, to be on the same page, that these are the things always swirling or underguarding, underpinning everything that we do as a church and as a Christian church. So with that introduction, ministry presupposition number two. The Bible is true and is trustworthy in all that it teaches. That's a presupposition for us. That's a beginning point for us in all that, we, all that we do. That's what we believe by faith. The Scriptures are the sure and confident Word that we believe by faith. It's just a presupposition. In our Confession of Faith, chapter 1, verse 4, and I do have slides for this, it says this, 
the authority of the Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the Word of God. That's the presupposition. We believe it's the Word of God. Now, we believe that because of the self-attestation of Scripture. It proves itself. And by faith, we believe it. A few passages. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19-21. through 21. This is why we believe the Scriptures are to be true and authoritative. It's what they say and prove of themselves. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is where we get our doctrine of Scripture from. As we do 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which was our reflection this morning. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then in 1 John chapter 5, it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. And then lastly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God continually because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the Word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. These are why we say it's a presupposition. The Scriptures speak of it as just being true. The Word of God is the Word of God. Now secondly, and this is beautiful and important, Though beautiful in its composition, Holy Scripture is only received by faith through the work of the Holy Spirit. That is to say, you English majors, you might awe and wonder at the beauty of Scripture. But that's not why we believe it's the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit who brings conviction of the truth that it's the Word of God. Again, from our Confession of Faith, chapter 1, verse 5, listen to how it says this. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. I know that's a lot of words. I know they're archaic. But you need to understand, this is what we believe. We're not persuaded by the Scriptures as the Word of God just because somebody said they were. They have proved themselves to be the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit alone does that proving in our hearts. That's our presupposition of how God works 
by and with His Word. Objection. Worldly objection. This is nonsense, some will say. It's so out of touch with the modern world. It's too unsophisticated for an educated people, our world would say. What, do you want to be a knuckle-dragging Neanderthal and for everyone to think that you're just caught back in time? Well, that's how the mind of unbelief reasons. But the response of faith says this. No, we don't want to be those things, and we're not those things. We've just been persuaded by the inner working of the Holy Spirit who has convinced us otherwise. And we believe by faith that it is the Word of God. Amen? That's the tension that you may be living in at work or at school or in your community. That's the real tension. We believe by faith, and as a church, we believe by faith it is the Word of God. We probably need seminars, some kind of teaching. Maybe it's Sunday school, small groups. I don't know what it is. But to better equip every one of us as a church family to understand why we have such confidence in Scripture. Why are there 66 books and not more? What about the Apocrypha? How were such decisions about the Bible made? And aren't there contradictions in the Bible? Does it contradict itself and contradict proven science? Or does it not? These are all good questions, and we should probably do a good or a better job of equipping every one of us in these things. So just a heads up on that. My hope is that in the near future, that we're going to provide some kind of seminars or opportunities for small group learning to better sharpen all of us to understand our doctrine of Scripture so that you can talk about it and share it with others that they too might be persuaded by the Holy Spirit in the truth of Scripture. In fact, in a few weeks, we're going to have what I'm going to call listening sessions. Uh, the elders are hoping to meet either with all of you in a meeting or two or in several different smaller meetings. And we're going to talk about what can we do that you would show up for that would be ministries that better equip us. Okay? That's weeks ahead, but listen out for listening sessions where we can strengthen all of our ministries to strengthen who we are as a church. It's important. Our doctrine of Scripture is vitally important. Martin Luther said this, A simple layman, a, a Christian, armed with Scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Amen? That's our vision that our laity, our, our church members, would be equipped with Scripture. And you would be a mighty instrument in the hands of God by the work of the Holy Spirit in your ministries. Secondly, or actually thirdly, ministry presupposition number three. That is that theology is possible and can be helpful. Now think about that. That's a presupposition for us. Theology is possible. You can do theology, and it can be helpful. Now, why that caveat? Because theology can be unhelpful, right? If it's bad theology. Lig Duncan, in 1993, wrote a little article that I read when I was right out of college, and I was doing youth ministry, and I remember where I was when I read it, and I remember the impact it had on me, but the statement that I remember is this. Lig Duncan said, Everyone is a theologian. The only question is, are you a good one or a bad one? But everybody has a view of God. The real question is, is it, is it a good, right, biblical, faithful view, or is it, is it wonky? We don't want a wonky theology. We want a faithful theology. And that is possible. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. That was our call to worship. And it drips with theology. It drips with Christology, who Jesus is and what He came to do. This is what I'm talking about. You can have a theology. We have a theology as it's given to us in Scripture. So I want you to hear it again as I read it. Listen to the theology 
that we're given in the Bible. The Son, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. That's just theology. Dripping of theology, and it's to be our theology. And so we believe that theology is possible and it can be helpful when it's faithful to the Bible. And that's where our commitment lies. Colossians chapter 1 is simply an example of theology in biblical doctrine. And then Luke chapter 24 verse 27, the long Easter afternoon passage that I read. All I want to emphasize there is that Jesus Himself is demonstrating theology. Here these disciples are discouraged. They don't understand what's happened, and nobody does at that moment. And Jesus comes up and just asks a question. So what are you doing? And I love that. Um, it's, just, it's just so simple that Jesus wants to hear them say for themselves their state of mind and their understanding. And after hearing them recite the events of the last few days, there's this, this biting comment that says, Jesus said to them, Oh foolish ones, how slow in heart you are to believe. Then he says, he does theology, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, talking through the whole Old Testament. Jesus reveals that they were all about him. And so Jesus demonstrates the practice of theology in that passage. Charles Spurgeon says this, the devil has seldom done a cleverer thing than hinting to the church that part, that part of her divine mission is to provide entertainment for the people with a view to winning them. Providing amusement for the people is nowhere spoken of in the Scriptures as a function of the church. The need is for biblical doctrine so understood and felt that it sets men afire. Amen? You know, in our modern era, we can, as a church, very easily get pulled into a consumer mentality that, hey, let's just make the people happy and give them what they want. Well, we're all for fellowship. We're all for hospitality. But remember, what's driving us is that our theology would set us on fire that we would believe what God has given us. So we want to major in the majors and minor in the minors. And I think Spurgeon says it well there. And for this reason, because all this is true, we have a confession of faith. We have a theology that seeks to do what Spurgeon just said. And for us, that confession of faith, you, some of you know and know well, is the Westminster Confession of Faith. Written centuries ago, and it has withstood the test of time. Is it a perfect document? No, not by a long shot. But it is an excellent summary of biblical doctrine, of biblical teaching. On this subject, all officers in the PCA, elders and deacons, are unified. The Westminster Confession is our confession. And though exceptions can be taken to it, I myself took several and have taken several and do take several, but no exceptions are allowed that are believed to strike at any vital, essential teaching of Scripture, which would lead God's people to stray from the path of biblical faith and practice. Now, that being said, the confession does not claim for itself, nor do we of it, that it is perfect. Rather, it admits, and we do too, that synods and councils, church courts, can and do 
err, just as Christians do. Nevertheless, we believe having a succinct and unifying confession of faith is of significant benefit to the life, health, and well-being of the Christian church and all of her members. Fourthly, we are a confessional church and a connectional church. We are connected with and accountable to other churches, presbyteries, and even other denominations who share that same confession of faith and who are like-minded and unified in our fellowship. In our compa- we are compatible in our purpose and practice of ministry, all of which is made possible by having a shared theological confession of faith. Now, you know that there are others within the Christian church globally who disagree with that. There are those who call themselves Bible churches, those who are independent congregational churches who profess no creed but Christ. No need for a confession, no need for a theology, we just need Jesus. No creed but Christ, and some even suggest because doctrine divides. Therefore, no doctrine, just Jesus in the Bible. But that just doesn't work. It doesn't play out well in the life of God's people. That's not been our belief. That's not been our experience. That's not been our historic practice. On that subject, Sinclair Ferguson says this. This was an interview with Ligonier. He said this, You might say the Bible is our confession, but that doesn't help us. All that tells us is that the contents of this book constitute our confession. The real question for the church is, what are the contents of the Bible? What does the Bible say? What does it teach? And what does it mean? A really good confession of faith is a summary of the theology of the Bible. Written, of course, in a particular historical context, but with a view to the people of God in every place, and in every generation. The Westminster Confession of Faith does that. It serves us well as an instrument to discern virtually everything you encounter in the life of the Christian church, including principles for applying the gospel to situations that the Westminster divines never contemplated would exist. Again, that's a lot of words. But I think he says it, and he says it well. The church is served well by agreeing on the contents of what the Scriptures teach and then being on the same page and laboring for those in ministry. Now, fourthly and lastly, ministry presupposition number four, the church. The church is real. It is a real thing. It exists and it persists. Three things about that. The church is real, it exists, and it persists because God's eternal purpose has always been in the church, for the church, with the church. God's enduring promise sustains the church, meaning that God has a never-ending people. So in this way, the church is front and center as the apple of God's eye. It's been His purpose since the beginning of time, and it is a beautiful thing to know. It is a beautiful thing to know. The church, we tend to think of church as just another thing we do. It's what we do on Sunday. But that is not a robust view of our doctrine of the church. We're not just another people that we see during the week. We're the very heartbeat of what God is doing in the world. We're to embody His message and mission to the world. The church, as the people of God, are the means by which and through which He accomplishes His purposes and fulfills His covenant promises in the earth. The Holy Spirit works through the church. 
Now, that does not make us prideful. That does not make us arrogant. Rather, it should humble us and sober us to be on task, to take it seriously. We sing sometimes in this church Samuel Stone's hymn, The Church is One Foundation. Listen to that stanza. I think it's the fifth stanza. It says, The church shall never perish. There's the doctrine right there. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish, and is with her to the end. You see, God is sustaining His church because of His promises, because of what He said He's been doing since day one. So the Bible, theology, and the church... Those are always underpinning our confidence in ministry, our purpose in ministry, why we do what we do the way that we do it. Because it's who we are according to Scripture. Now you take those three things. You take the Bible and theology and the church, and you tie all that together into a a bow, a pretty bow. And do you know what you get? Faithful to the Scriptures, true to the Reformed faith, and obedient to the Great Commission. Does that sound familiar? That's the motto of the Presbyterian Church in America. It's on your bulletin every Sunday on the front right side. That's our motto. We want to be faithful to the Scriptures, the Bible. We want to be true to the Reformed faith. That's our theology that comes from the Bible. And we want to be obedient to to the Great Commission, because those are our marching orders. So it just makes all the sense in the world. It's a presupposition. It's not something that's up for debate. This is who we are and what we believe according to Scripture. And it's a beautiful thing. So we've been to the engine room. Let's go to the pool deck next. Not really, but wouldn't it be nice? But I do, I wanted you to hear that these are the things that underpin what we do and help drive us like an engine to stay on a faithful path. Let's pray and then let's sing and then we'll come to the table together. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we rejoice over the truths that we've just heard from Scripture. That you have given us a sure and certain word. And by faith we believe that. And Lord... The Son of Righteousness is for His people. And He has redeemed them by His blood. And we believe that by faith. And that He would love His church as wayward as we are. As half-hearted as we are. But that He would love us eternally. Without end. Lord, these are truths that should sober us and humble us. And now, Lord, as we sing of You and Your great love, that You're the King of love, the great shepherd, as Psalm 23 teaches us as a theology, may You comfort us in these truths as You welcome us to Your table. We ask it and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.